Welcome to the Birth Journeys Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Hoff, BSN RN. I am a wife, a mother of two, and a nurse specializing in the care of women and newborns. In this podcast, we will share powerful journeys of birth givers with the goals of lifting the veil on the birth experience, healing through sharing, and beginning an open conversation to strengthen trust and promote transparency between birthing people and healthcare providers. Hello. Today I have with me Dr. Amy Loden. Dr. Loden is the mother of four, a board-certified physician specializing in internal medicine and lifestyle medicine, and a board-certified health and life coach. Dr. Loden is here today to share her birth story. You can connect with Dr. Loden at vitalitymwc.com. Dr. Loden, welcome, and thank you for joining me. Hi, Kelly. Thanks for having me. It's so good to be here. Yeah, it's good to see you again. I think it's been like 15 years. <laughs> Let's not uh, advertise that too loudly, should we'll we? We'll forget about that. Yeah. <laughs> it was just yesterday. <laughs> oh, but it is good to see you and uh, to catch up. And I really appreciate yeah. you inviting me here today to talk about birthing stories and the trauma that sometimes we carry with us emotionally or the fears we may have going into a birth that hasn't happened yet. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure you have a lot of insight. Sadly, I do. Um, my birth stories started with my my daughter who's now 10 and she really the pregnancy was fairly uncomplicated i was working in the hospital full time no real concerns and what ended up happening was i had gestational diabetes and woke up one day and my glucose was 40 which is very bad and we couldn't figure out why it was so low it turns out my placenta was failing so first it had caused resistance to glucose. And so my insulin levels were more uh, higher than they needed to be. But then what ended up happening is it failed. And when it failed, there was concern that is it going to stop having blood flow to the baby? So of course, then I'm admitted immediately. And there's all the drama about, oh my gosh, the baby's not supposed to be here for two more weeks. And in the scope of things, coming two weeks early is not that big of a deal anymore. But it was certainly not what I had emotionally planned for. So I'm admitted on a Friday night. No big deal. Well, actually, I was really scared. It's like, I don't know what's going to happen. Even though I'm a doctor, I know what happens. I know part A has to come out of part B, but this is really scary. So we go in and Saturday, nothing's happening. I'm literally sitting on a, whatever those bouncy balls are in the hospital to help you birth. And my Pitocin's like at the max dose and I'm feeling nothing, nothing. Like this is not good. So that was all day Saturday all day Sunday. My mom finally flies in from rural Missouri where she's been. I'm living in New York City at the time and she flies in. I'm like, yeah, this is day four and I have nothing. And I'm supposedly having this child that has no placenta working. This is not good. So my anxiety level had been through the roof by that time. I hadn't slept for three days because in the hospital, you just don't sleep. (laughs) And the food sucked. And then they wouldn't let me eat. And I was like, I'm going to become this horrible person if you don't like either take this baby out of me or something. So they said, fine, we're going to just try breaking your water, seeing how that helps. Well, that did make some contractions happen. That was a very nice awakening to what contractions felt like. And that was probably the most horrible six hours of my life until I figured out that oh, epidurals might be necessary and epidurals are okay. And you're not a terrible person if you use an epidural, which was really, for me, startling because even though I was a doctor and even though I knew all these medical things, I really went into the birth experience thinking, I'm not going to need an epidural. I'm going to do this naturally. Like, I've got this, right? And like when that water broke, I was like, oh no, 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 this is not working. So I'm doing the breathing. We're doing fine. They finally get the epidural. And then I started having a pain I shouldn't have had despite having an epidural. I was like, there is something wrong. And the doctor's like, oh, no, no, you're doing great. I was like, there is something wrong. I don't know what's wrong, but there's something wrong. My mom's there. She's like, you're fine. Just listen to the doctor, right? My husband's saying the same thing. And I'm in tears because I haven't eaten. I'm sleep deprived. I'm in pain and I know something's wrong. And sure enough, something was wrong. So instead of my daughter trying to come out like a normal child with her head, she came out with her elbow. You're not supposed to do that. And so I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And so I'm looking at the OB and I was like, can you promise me that my child is going to have a normal arm, no shoulder dystocia if I let you deliver her vaginally? Because they're like ready to go. And I was like, no, you promised me this can happen or we're doing a C-section. So I ended up with a C-section. It ended up being that the, the chief resident actually had to push my daughter back in through the vaginal canal while the OB pulled her out from the uterus. It was not cool. And then whether it was me, whether it was the event, I don't know. I couldn't connect with her. 
Like I could not emotionally bond with my child. I had looked forward to this child. I had everything ready for her. I was ready to have, you know, be the mom of the year. And I just looked at her. I was like, I don't feel anything for my baby. This is not normal. I was trying to breastfeed, couldn't get it. It just wasn't connecting, um, struggled with that, went home, continued to struggle with it. Pediatricians telling me, you know, formula is not poison. I'm like, breast is best, you know, trying to do everything we learned in medical school and feeling like a total failure. And at the end of the time, it ended up that for her breast wasn't best. She didn't like breastfeeding. I didn't like breastfeeding. And we ended up, she's a wonderful developed child now. She's everything I wanted my daughter to be and more, right? And it, there was so much in those moments, so much emotion, so much focus that the bigger picture got lost. And the bigger picture was, you know, healthcare doesn't always do what we think it's going to do, but they're going to do their best to take care of you. And your doctors and your nurses, they may make mistakes. My doctor was wrong. There was something in my body that was not going right. Right. And we knew this finally. And she was flat wrong. But at the end of the day, I kept advocating for myself and I kept saying that, listen to me. And the nurses listened to me. The doctors finally started listening. You would think a doctor listens to a doctor, right? But no, it didn't work for me. Maybe I did something wrong, but it just didn't work. And, you know, I think there's a lot of commonality in that and what I've heard from other moms. So I'm like, cool. Well, I'm going to have, you know, a, a great daughter. I probably need a son to even out the balance. So a year later, you know, her first birthday, my husband's like, hey, you want to have another one? I'm like, sure, let's do this again. It'll be easy. Um, no. I had gestational diabetes again, more severe, was on massive doses of insulin. Mind you, my body weight was totally normal at the time, which as an internal medicine doctor, right? Like this is my bread and butter. This is what we do. And it was maddening to have this diabetes be so out of control. And this is what I treat. And then the next thing I know, you know, I'm 30 weeks pregnant and they're like, um, your baby's not moving. And that is the last thing you want to hear when you go in for an ultrasound. Like we hear a heartbeat, the heartbeat's fine, but the baby's not moving. And they're like, this sometimes happens with gestational diabetes. So I'm admitted to the hospital. They do this whole workup. They're like, your blood pressure's 210 over 140. I'm like, is that even real? Like people, remeasure this, you know? So my doctor mind is like freaking out and telling them that they don't know what they're doing to use the right technique because they're not measuring blood pressure correctly. And like, I'm schooling them in my neurosis of instability here. And at the end of the day, my blood pressure was high. So I got pulled out of work and I was told to sit on bed rest, which I did for eight weeks. I understand that bed rest is debatable. I understand that there's lots of differences. That's what we chose. And it worked out. My son was born. He's a wonderful human being and super happy to have him. Fast forward four years. And for whatever reason, my brain is like, huh, wouldn't it be nice to have a third kid? Just one more. Why, 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 right? And so uh, my husband's like looking at me like, seriously, are we doing this again? I was like, okay, well, let's just do this. Let's try IVF because now I'm like 35. Let's just try it. We have benefits right now. I'm going to leave this institution. I won't have benefits. If we just decide don't, we don't want to do it, we don't have to. So we do. We ended up having three embryos and IVF is a whole nother story, right? Like that world is its own world. Craziness. Ignoring that. And <laughs> we go in for our first appointment after the, the uh, embryo transfer. And, you know, you're in there and they've got the window shades drawn for privacy and your husband's standing behind you and they insert the speculum to put in the ultrasound wand, right? And the tech, I still am mad at her about this, but she says, oh, this is not good. Like first ultrasound, she tells me, oh, this is not good. And that was like the absolute wrong thing to say to any mother, but you, you just don't say that, right? So I was like, okay, what? I thought I was dealing with a dead baby. I mean, I really thought when she said that there was, we didn't have a viable pregnancy. And she's like, this is going to take a lot longer than I planned. I was like, because why? And she's like, you're having twins. What? <laughs> we have identical voice. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Right. So like, if there's bad luck in pregnancy, I am going to have it. <laughs> so by the way, I love my boys. They're wonderful. But yes, that was, I, I just have never really forgiven her. I hold grudges for a long time and I have never forgiven her for that because I really thought I was dealing with a dead baby. So pregnancy is fine. At this point, I've just accepted I'm going to have gestational diabetes, right? Like this is my life. So I tell my doctor, you're not allowed to manage my diabetes. I'm a doctor that deals with this. I'm doing this and I'm going to do it my own way, which I did. I don't recommend that. That is a terrible plan, but I did it. <laughs> and 
later in pregnancy, about 25 weeks or so, I started getting weird feelings. Something wasn't right. I couldn't really place it. It was an emotion. It was a men- like this mental feeling. Something's not right. And as a very driven type A woman, like we all know that I'm going to have anxiety. So I'm blowing this off, right? I'm thinking, I'm just amped up about this. I've got two kids. I'm just getting closer and, you know, it's end of second trimester and I'm just starting to worry and I need to just calm down. So for three or four weeks, I tried to do this. By the way, I was working in an OB office at the time this happened. So it just like, right, it, you can't get any more craziness. And about, when was it? It was 31 weeks. I had just made 31 weeks. And my leg really started hurting. And I was like, what in the heck is going on with my leg? Um, go home that weekend. I'm relaxing. Friday night, I tell my husband, I, my leg really hurts. I can't get up. And he's like, what do you mean you can't get up? So I was like, okay, just hear me out. I'm just going to go to bed and see how it feels tomorrow. Well, tomorrow didn't change. I sat there all day Saturday. It's like, my leg is killing me. It was like my entire, I couldn't even specify, is it my muscle? Is it the, you know, the joint? I have no idea. And so I was like, just, we're going to have to get checked out. Like it's been 24 hours, Saturday night, call your mom who lives an hour away, have her come in and be with the two and the four-year-old, right? Or I guess there were four and six at that time, but we got to go in. This is not cool. So I go in and like, yeah, we don't know what's wrong with your leg, but your blood pressure is 210 over 150. Like, are you kidding me? We're not doing this again. So they're like, we're going to admit you because your baby is at least viable, your babies, plural, and, you know, we should check out your blood pressure. So fine, admit me. I don't care. Give me something for my pain. Let me sleep and I'm going home tomorrow. Fast forward 12 hours and they're like, you're not going home until your babies are delivered because you have preeclampsia. Congratulations. Are you kidding me? Like I have patients to see on Monday. I will go home, get my schedule fixed. I'll be back in a week. They're like, no you're not leaving the hospital. So that did not help my blood pressure. The fact that I was separated from my four and my six-year-old who slept with me every night, don't judge me, but they did. And this was not the life I had planned for this pregnancy. And all the while, like my other two babies, I can feel them moving and they're doing fine. So I'm like, I can feel them moving. I don't have bad preeclampsia. Send me home. I promise I'll take my blood pressure. They're like, are you out of your ever loving mind? You're not going anywhere. Sit still. So I'm 31 weeks pregnant and still in the antepartum unit. And there is there, I'm 31 weeks pregnant. And they're like, yeah, you're going to be here for at least three weeks. We're hoping for six. I'm like what? I can't do this. This is not an option. And that was now Sunday. It's like, okay, fine. Then they really turned up the heat. They're like, oh, by the way, we have to do ultrasound checks on your babies every few hours, every single day until you deliver. No. So it doesn't help my story at all, I suppose, that I've totally blamed the residents for this next part. And residents, you know, I love them. I was one, but I really think that they screwed this part up. I told them, I don't know what happened, but my water broke. And they're like, no, it didn't. It's like, Yes, it did. There's water draining out of my body. Like, oh, you're just peeing. It's like, no, I'm an educated person. And even if I wasn't, I know the difference between pee and something else. My water broke. No, 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 that couldn't be. I was like, well, you're doing these dead gum ultrasounds every six hours anyway. So just put the damn probe on and look and see, did the water break or not? Well, sure enough, one of the babies has no water around it. So now we've got a a premature rupture of membranes on top of preeclampsia. And my blood pressure kept going higher and higher because it was so far out of my control. Everything in my life up until that point, I had complete control over. In the hospital, you have don't, you don't have control. Even when you advocate for yourself, it is the most vulnerable a person can be, in my opinion. So by Thursday night, if I thought I was psychotic after my first kid with no sleep, by Thursday night with the twins, it was awful. Talking to some of the people in retrospect who talked to me, they're like, you didn't make any sense, the stuff you were saying. And everyone was like, well, it's the magnesium. It's this, it's that, the other. Frankly, I think it's sleep deprivation. But, you know, I'm not a, a real doctor. I'm not an OB. So what do I know, right? <laughs> and uh, you, you're not supposed to be an internal medicine doctor arguing with an OB, by the way. I learned that. So... Thursday night, I'm not feeling right. I'm struggling to breathe. I can't walk across my hospital room without shortness of breath. And I'm talking to my mom and my sister. They're five hours away. And at the time, I didn't know it, but they both looked at each other after we got off the phone and said, we need to go up there. Something is wrong. So they're driving up this, and I don't know this. They walk in and they're like, 
something's really wrong with you. And I was like, yeah, I know. It's, I'm in the hospital. That's what's wrong with me. These people are like not letting me treat this as an outpatient. I could take these medicines at home. This is, I'm not even on an IV medicine. There's no reason to be home, right? So again, I lost that argument. And I'm not very good at arguments, it might seem. The OB says, well, listen, I don't know why you're short of breath, but it's probably just because you're pregnant. I was like, no, please stop saying that. Please get me another doctor. And I actually demanded that. I was like, you're all fired. Something is not right here. You're not listening to me. You're telling me I'm peeing across the room when I'm walking across the room because I have a broken water. They get me the high-risk obese. The high-risk obese look over everything. They're like, you know, why don't we just get a heart ultrasound and make sure that there's no problem with your heart? Well, you know how my story is going to end, right? Like this is obviously going to be a problem. So I have heart failure. My heart is not working. Like that is why I can't breathe. It's not a blood clot. It's not any of these other things that, you know, supposedly I was going to have. No, my heart's just not beating. Like uh, that might be a problem. So that one they got my attention with. The high risk OB comes in and she's like, you have to go to the operating room. It's like, no, no, give me some Lasix. I'm a medicine doctor. This is what I do. Just give me some Lasix. I'll be fine. We're going to keep these little kids cooking until it's longer along. She's like, that's fine. We can give you some Lasix, but here's how it's going to play out. Either I'm going to take you to the operating room tonight and we're going to have these babies and we might give you some Lasix afterwards to help you breathe, or I'm going to wait 24 hours and I'm going to intubate you because you won't be able to breathe. Your lungs are so full of water. And then I'm going to take you to the operating room and do the same thing. So the question is, do you want to hold your babies tonight or not? And I was like, well, you don't give me very many uh, choices here, do you? So I went to the operating room that night and, you know, looking at the pictures, it was, I, I didn't think they were going to survive. They came out, they were blue. It turns out that's what they're supposed to be at 31 weeks, but as a non-OB doctor, I didn't remember that. And so they're in these look like turkey basting bags, right? Trying to keep their body heat warm. And like, I'm just convinced I've killed my boys, right? I am laying there on the operating table. I'm hearing them intubate these babies. I'm hearing them hook them up to all these machines. I'm hearing the, you know, these comments in a mind that's sleep deprived on magnesium, right? So everything seems worse, doesn't feel right, and isn't taken in context. And I just start sobbing on the operating table. I'm like, I can't breathe because I'm crying so hard and I'm laying down and my heart's failing. And it's like, I killed my boys. I killed my babies. And my husband, he was like, you just need to calm down. And it's going to be okay. I'm like, I'm going to punch you, except my hands are tied down to the damn operating table. So I can't reach up here and punch you in the nose. Don't tell me it's going to be okay. Go with one of our kids. And I sent my mom with the other kids. So finally get back to the room and I don't have my babies. The pain medicine's making me loopy on top of all this. I'm like, just give me some chocolate ice cream, right? That'll fix everything. <laughs> so I have ate like six things of chocolate ice cream just so that I could get to the next place mentally, which um, ended up being that I could go see my boys. And, you know, I was able to hold them and they were able to respond to me. And the short end of it is that they, they came out fine, but they spent 11 weeks in the NICU and it was emotionally traumatizing. It was mentally overwhelming. I don't know very many women who did this, but the way I coped with it is I went back to work after two weeks. I couldn't deal with being with them all day. It was too much. And so I went back to work. It's like, I feel control here. I know what I'm doing here. I can make a difference here, but I can't help my voice. And so, you know, I think when I look back on all these different stories, it's apparent to me that were these things going to happen no matter what? Yes. Am I fortunate that it happened to me as a doctor? Actually, I think it was because now my entire career is focused on how do we prevent disease? How do we help moms that are going to become pregnant or who had pregnancy complications reduce their risks? And it really opened my eyes a lot. You know, after my first pregnancy, I said to my OB, okay, what do I need to do so that I don't get diabetes? And she looked at me and she says, you delivered the baby, you're done. And so then I was like, okay, I know that's not right because I'm a medicine doctor, right? We know these women are at higher risk. We know that within five years of a pregnancy that half these women are going to have type 2 diabetes who had gestational diabetes. So I go to my internist who doesn't do anything with women's health. And this is in New York City at one of the most elite academic institutions in the country. And I ask him, okay, what do I need to do so that I don't have type 2 diabetes? And he looks at me, he's like, well, you're not pregnant anymore. You'll be fine. Are you kidding me? And then I just started paying more attention to what my patients were telling me. They were hearing the same stories. This is not acceptable. We have the resources to help these moms. We know what they need to do differently. Their pregnancy has unmasked a problem and it is time to do something about it. 
So gestational diabetes, I started paying a, a ton more attention to after the twins were born and the whole preeclampsia thing. And I realized, wow, there's a whole different side of this too, which is that women who have preeclampsia are at four times higher risk of dying from heart disease before the age of 60, just from that one risk factor. You add to it any multiple pregnancies that have more than one risk factor. So high blood pressure and pregnancy during my second one, gestational diabetes and all three, I realized I'm a really high risk of dying before I'm 60. And I don't have traditional risk factors. I don't smoke. I'm active. I eat a fairly stable diet. It's gotten a lot better since then after I've changed things. Everything that my doctors were telling me to do, I was doing, and it wasn't the right thing. It wasn't enough. And so I decided to be my own doctor and not tell anybody else. And it's worked just fine. My numbers look amazing. My total cholesterol is like 130, which it has never been in my entire life. My glucose is totally normal. But it took a lot of intentional changes and it took a lot of awareness. And because I'm a physician and because I have training in internal medicine, I have a platform to tell women that there are choices, there are options, there are things you can control. And every one of my birth stories was about being out of control. And it was teaching not just as a patient how to navigate a broken healthcare system, but teaching as a person and as a mom how to make my world better, my kids' world better. Like all four, all four of my kids have higher risk for diabetes just because I had gestational diabetes. I would love to have every pediatrician in the country tell that to every mom who had gestational diabetes. I guarantee you these moms would take different steps if they knew they had the risk. If they knew that they were going to die before they could see their grandchildren because they didn't change the risks for heart disease, there's not a, a sane, normal person in this world who wouldn't do something different. People don't know. And because they don't know, they can't change. The medical system is not telling them. We know in the literature it's there. We, there's so much clear evidence that it's there and no one's telling these moms. So that's what I do. I spend my days working with moms, telling them sometimes it's future moms, right? They're not even pregnant, but maybe they have PCOS. Maybe they are overweight. Maybe their mom has diabetes, but we're working on how do we intervene in a lifestyle mediated way, not a medication way, but how can we teach you the right things to do? What does a healthy diet even mean? What does it mean to be regularly active? Like all these things that you read about on these websites that are supposed to be telling and teaching us. They're not doing it in a way that makes it easy. It's not practical. Telling me to eat more fruits and vegetables means nothing if I don't know how to cook them, if I don't know how to prepare and store them so they're not wasting. It does nothing if I can't access them, if I can't afford them. So there has to be other conversations that are being had, not just, well, you want to lose a little weight, so why don't you you know, move more and eat less? That's nonsense. There's a reason it's not working. You know? All right. Show me how. Exactly. <laughs> so that's what we do here at Vitality. We spend time working with people one-on-one, -on -one, having much longer appointments, but really helping them, coaching them, showing them how to use food as medicine. And really, that's the whole crux of this. 80% of the problems that we experience, whether it's in these pregnancy type situations or as adults, the internal medicine problems I treat, 80% of them are related to diet and people simply don't know. And that is unacceptable. So I digress, but thank you for listening to my story. <laughs> this no, is I think that's really important because that was inspired. Like your complete career change was inspired by your your pregnancy and what potentially could have been prevented or at the very least mitigated Correct. during your pregnancy. Correct. We don't know that we can completely stop the the nature from happening, but you can you can mitigate those. Symptoms. Absolutely, you can. You can do better when you know better. Exactly. And, you yeah. know, some of the most rewarding things for me, I think of a woman who she had gestational diabetes in her first pregnancy, got pregnant again. I worked with her. I saw her every single week for second and third trimester. So we're talking, what is that, 20 something weeks? She didn't use insulin at all. Mm -hmm. She was well controlled with diet because someone could show her how. Mm -hmm. People tell me every day, I know what to do. I just need to do it. And that partly is true. We do need to do what we think we need to do. That's, you know, healthy habits, but people really actually don't know what to do. I went to medical well, I mean, school I, and don't know, right? Like, I mean, yes, I totally get it because it's like, we studied the stuff. I mean, I, full disclosure was at medical school at one point. <laughs> it didn't amount to anything. <laughs> But I mean, I studied again, you know, I had to, when I went to nursing school, I studied it again. And, but still today I have to sit down and like, if I have to do diabetic teaching, 
My gosh. I mean, it's just, it's a lot. It is a lot. For even if you're in the medical profession. And then it's not just teaching the carb counts and all that Mm -hmm. stuff. It's the hardest part is teaching how to do it. And you have to get into someone's lifestyle and get into their head and their habits and all of that to be able to even begin to make a difference in helping them make healthy choices. Correct. And so that's why I think it's just so fascinating that the path that you've gone on, I think it's amazing that you've been able to integrate medicine and the preventative part, and then also the mindset and health and life coaching and all of the stuff that you're doing. It's like, it's exactly what every doctor needs to do if they want to prevent disease. Right. But honestly, most doctors don't want to prevent disease. They want to treat yeah, disease. Or they don't know that they want to, you know, because we don't, we don't learn to prevent disease we don't. necessarily. And that's one of the things I really admire about the nursing profession, actually. They do a wonderful job at teaching and education. One of the things I'd love to see improved in the medical system is, you know, why is payment linked to treating a disease, prescribing a medication, and doing a test? Yeah. That's wrong. Right. It needs to be how long are you spending with the patient and how much is the patient's in, impact changed because of that time. Mm-hmm. It needs to be, mm-hmm. yes, I understand we have to do valuable work, but it needs to be things that have a, a measurable transformation and not having right. gestational diabetes in a second or third pregnancy is a pretty good marker of that. Not yeah. having diabetes five years after your pregnancy, pretty good marker, mm-hmm. but we have to be willing as a country to invest in long-term health. And right now we're not willing to do that. Are you pregnant and planning a hospital birth? You don't need a birth plan. You need a birth vision. In my opinion, birth plans set you up for failure. Yep, I said it. Hear me out before you turn off this podcast. You may think that by downloading a generic birth plan, it means you're in control. The truth is it's not that simple. No one can control exactly how their birth will go. There are way too many variables. What every pregnant person wants is to walk into the hospital pregnant and to walk out with a healthy newborn in their arms. The journey in between is the murky part. It's hard to know what issues might come up that need to be addressed. If you focus your energy on a birth vision rather than giving your power to a birth plan, you can empower yourself to make the best choices for you and your baby. That's why you need to get into my Empowered Hospital Birth Program. As a labor nurse and mindset coach, I can help guide you through the process of maintaining the calm autonomy that will help you achieve the birth vision you desire. In my Empowered Hospital Birth Program, I will help you identify the source of anxiety you have surrounding hospital birth, fill in knowledge gaps to make sure that you are fully informed and confident, learn key phrases so you can better communicate with your medical team, emotionally process your fears so that they don't hold power over you. Go to kellyhoff.com backslash empowered to book a free 30-minute private birth vision call where we will identify your top fears and must-haves and gain clarity on exactly how you want to feel in the birth space. That's K-E-L-L-Y-H-O-F dot com backslash empowered. I'm honored to be a part of your birth journey. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's not where people are making money. No. It follows the money. (laughs) We have to, right, we have to, we have to pivot because we need to make people want that. Exactly. And then that's where the money's going to exactly. go. Exactly. Yeah. It's frustrating. Yeah. Even as nurses, I mean, then there's the whole like, okay, well, um, you're technically doing your job. So then we can decrease staffing and you can give you two patients or three patients. Right. Like, well, okay, how are we supposed to educate those patients? Because that's the main, like that's, we have to do the care plan. We have to do the education plan, like all that stuff that we have to do in the, the charting and whatnot. But are we really doing it if you're taking away all our time and you're telling us to manage more patients? Like, come on. Yeah. That's not nursing. <laughs> That's paperwork. It's not. It's not. Exactly. It's paperwork. And we want to be at the bedside helping people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we both are finding ways to pivot our career to cater to people that need information and need to figure out how to make lifestyle choices and where those resources are. Absolutely. I think that's amazing. It's it's fascinating too if you think about so you you know, you were joking earlier, we met 15 years ago, right? So The research that was coming out 15 years ago when we were, when we met is only now being applied in medical practice. I remember that. Right? Right. Like there's stuff that comes up and I'm like, I learned that 15 years correct. ago. Why aren't we we're not doing, doing it. it? Yeah. Yeah. So I think the other side of this is people need to recognize that the healthcare system, yes, we all acknowledge it's broken, but what's particularly broken about it is we're practicing old medicine. 
And, and certainly to, one of the ways we've combated that here at Vitality is we actually created a, a distinct curriculum. So people can choose to work with us one-on-one. They can choose to work with a group. They can choose to just do a curriculum on their own. But we've taken the most evidence-based science and we update this regularly. And we say, all right, here's what we know now about nutrition. Here's what we now know about movement and sleep and stress. And when you start plugging in the latest science, it's shocking that people in real life get the same results as people in the studies. Who knew, right? Go figure. Right? <laughs> so uh, we just decided to be live 15 years in the future. I love it. It's so <laughs> much more rewarding to see people take control yeah. of their life and to come off of medications and go into pregnancy healthier, even if they're done having babies. These moms, you know, they'll come to me in their 40s and they have maybe five, 10 year olds and they'll be like, I'm having these horrible night sweats. And we're like, oh, geez, did you have a pregnancy problem? Yeah, I did. Well, there's a link there between menopause transitions and pregnancy. And no one's talking about this. And these moms are going into their 50s and then 60s and they're having heart attacks at 58, 62 because nobody did anything. And there's so much we can do. Wow. That's fascinating. There's one thing that you mentioned with your births, just briefly, because I think we have like four minutes. (laughs) (laughs) You're good. You mentioned that you had trouble because of the trauma bonding with your daughter. And it sounds like there was a lot of trauma with the twins Mm -hmm. and you found your ability to feel somewhat in control or feel like you could do something to help by channeling into going back to work, which which I think is brilliant because you know yourself Mm -hmm. that well and you know, it's like, I'm going to focus on what I can control. I just wonder what steps did you take? Because I feel like you're probably bonded with your kids at this point. So what did that journey look like for you? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And I didn't mention, so my second child and then my twins, I was able to breastfeed them fine. And so there's a part of me that always questions, was all the pressure to breastfeed part of the bonding dysfunction? And was all of the either internal or perceived, I almost felt like a failure for not being able to breastfeed or bond with her. Mm -hmm. And so I think there was a little bit going into my second delivery and ultimately with the twins that I knew I needed to do something different. Now, my son, he breastfed for a year. He loved breastfeeding and it was no big mm-hmm. deal. It's like it, it just was natural for him. So going into the twins, I was very encouraged. I was like, OK, I can do this. I can get all the bonding and get all these wonderful things that, you know, happen with my mm-hmm. son. It, my daughter doesn't predict it. It wasn't easy for those babies to breastfeed. They had a really hard time. And you have to think, too, like the suck reflex, all the things that they have to have to successfully breastfeed, they were developing outside of me when it should have developed Mm -hmm. inside. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was able, thankfully, to have a little bit of perspective to know what good breastfeeding was and good bonding felt like through breastfeeding because of my son. And so I was able to stick with it with the boys. I didn't feel as emotionally disconnected as I did with my daughter, but I did not feel as emotionally connected to them until I was home with them and I knew they were going to live. I constantly worried in the ICU, were they going to die? You know, you hear these horrible stories and I was like, everything that went wrong could have gone wrong in my life, except I was alive. I guess I shouldn't say that. There's a lot that went right. I stayed alive, Yeah, but, um, and, and they did. But there was, there was a constant fear and a constant nagging of, are they going to survive the NICU? Are they going to grow? And every little thing was a new thing. And 11 weeks after 31 weeks means they were really going home at 42 weeks. Mm -hmm. That means that most of your listeners' babies went home before my twins did. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, the, the bonding for me with them was different than it was. And perhaps it is with all children, right? Every child, Mm -hmm. maybe you'd find with differently, but for them, it wasn't until I got home and I was holding them and I was regularly caring for them. And it was 24 seven in the NICU. Mm -hmm. The nurses did a lot of that, you know, Mm -hmm. partly my decision because I chose to work partly because I couldn't be there 24 seven, even if I hadn't chose to work, I needed to take care of my Mm -hmm. husband, myself and my other two children. And so there was a lot for me that didn't click until, Mm -hmm. um, then now, you know, I don't know how much you care about dad's birth stories, but my husband had a hard time connecting with them for almost two years. And, you know, the question is, was that because of the whole 11 weeks in the ICU? We don't know. Yeah. Uh, You know, every time I talk about having a fifth kid, he's horrified and walks away and sleeps in the kids' rooms. So. (laughs) Girl, please don't. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's what my OB tube said. She's like, I'll be worried. <laughs> she's like, seriously. But you know what, Kelly, there is one thing that's interesting. If I choose to go down this, I actually think I'm healthier mm-hmm. now than in any yeah, of my other true. pregnancies. And mm-hmm. when you look at inflammation, which is the underlying problem with gestational diabetes and preeclampsia mm-hmm. and gestational hypertension. And pretty much every, every problem, problem in right? Yeah. So if you look at it from that perspective, that's resolved. So the question yeah. is like, people are like, you're going to try that again? I was like, maybe, maybe not. That's none of your business. But right. I am going into it much healthier if I choose to do that, which sure. I yeah. think there's something to that. And I don't think we, I don't think we can quantify it, but I think it's real. Yeah, I think it is real. I think you're Right. And what I think I hear you saying is that I think it's amazing what the brain does to protect Mm -hmm. us, especially in those trauma experiences. And I just want to validate moms and dads that have a hard time with the bonding experience, because I think what happens is you don't allow yourself to bond until you can take that breath Mm -hmm. and relax and know that all is good. Mm -hmm. It is an innate part of a lot. A lot of us do this to protect ourselves. And it is a natural part of the brain. Some of us are able to work through those emotions better than others. Yeah. And uh, those of us that are verging on the type A, we do a lot. We do a lot to control our emotions. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Without really knowing it. And yeah. I think what we do is try to protect ourselves. And so I think that's a brilliant way to describe it because that's what it is. At the end of the day, mm-hmm. it's self-preservation. The brain exactly. seeks pleasure, it avoids pain and it tries to preserve itself. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint makes some sense. Our species wouldn't have survived had it not done this. But that's correct. But on the other hand, you know, we don't have to have the experiences moms are having today. Moms and dads, they don't. It is so true. It does not need to be the way it is. Yeah. There's no reason with the advances we have that these are the experience our patients are having, that our colleagues are having. Because you think, too, what's the uh, traumatic experience on the side of the OB or the nurse that's delivering and has seen a traumatic Mm -hmm. birth? There's a certain Mm -hmm. amount of protection that's happening there, too. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I I know I'm I'm guilty of it, even though I try to be mindful of it. And I know everybody that I work with yeah. says the same thing. And I mean, I, one small step at a time, I'm trying to yeah. make it better. Yeah, absolutely. And awareness is the first thing. And so, I mean, I, I really exactly. love that you're doing this and that your your passion is here. And it's it's been fantastic to reconnect with you. And I certainly hope yeah. the conversation, you know, continues and more of your listeners, you know, that they're empowered to make the change in their life, to realize they have a ton of control and that whatever decision they make is their decision. And I wish moms heard this louder because there's a certain amount that right or wrong, the medical profession puts on them. Community is large, puts on them cultures, religions puts on them Mm -hmm. that you have, that being a good mom is defined a certain way. And being a good Mm -hmm. mom is being a good mom to your kid, whatever that means. Yeah. Doing your best. That's right. Every single day and knowing that you're going to make mistakes, but not Mm -hmm. freaking out if that happens. If you don't make mistakes, Mm -hmm. you're a zombie. Who wants a zombie for a mom, right? (laughs) Yeah. And so it's, you have to fail to learn and grow and your kid, Mm -hmm. kids are so resilient and loving and they're going to just love you as long as you're loving them. Especially if you teach them to fail, to learn, to grow. Exactly. Teach them to fail well fail forward. I I think that there's so much to that. And the world will be a better place in a generation if we all decide Mm -hmm. to raise our kids like this. It doesn't matter what our beliefs are, um, you know, politically, socially, religiously. If we all agree that we are going to be the best parent, the world is going to look so different in 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's already looking different. Very cool. (laughs) Well, Dr. Loden, I don't want to keep you any longer, but anytime you want to come back on, talk about any specific topics that could help moms or families, parents, anything, please feel welcome to reach out to me. And I thank you so much for sharing your birth stories and how your career and life has grown and changed because of your motherhood journey. That's hard to say, motherhood journey. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm delighted to be here. I'm glad you reached out. You know, I certainly wish your listeners the very best in their stories. And I truly believe that everything can be as good as we want to design it if we're intentional and have that positive mindset that you're describing. And we each have a different story to tell. And when we're sharing that, we all become better for it. I agree. Dr. Loden, thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning into my podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future episodes. Don't forget to share the podcast with a friend who can benefit from the valuable insights that we share here. And if you could take a moment to leave a five-star rating and review, it would mean the world to me. If you're ready to work one-on-one with me to embark on a transformational journey towards a confident and empowered hospital birth experience, 
Go to kellyhoff.com backslash empowered and enroll in my Empowered Hospital Birth Coaching Program. Together, we'll create a roadmap to a birth experience that you'll cherish forever. That's K-E-L-L-Y-H-O-F dot com backslash empowered. Let's make your birth experience extraordinary.